listening to Joy 94.9 or perhaps watching at worldaidsdayworldwide.org. My name is Glenn Dalton and this hour we are talking about uh, no one being left behind, particularly on this special day, World AIDS Day, the connection between HIV and people who use drugs. I'm joined live in the studio by Dean Camilleri, who earlier today revealed via Facebook and also, as we say, to the world uh, that he was uh, living with HIV. And uh, also, we are joined by Peter Higgs from the Burnett Institute. Now, Dean, it's quite a courageous move to reveal this to the world, Mm -hmm. to reveal this to your closest networks on Facebook Mm -hmm. and to come and talk about it here uh, on the radio and on this worldwide broadcast. I know you were nervous. I don't want to don't want to stoke oh, that yeah, at, <laughs> in any case uh, at all. But I'm, I am very interested in terms of when you talk about the reactions that you had to your diagnosis mm-hmm. and the particular stigma that uh, that perhaps went along with that, or the perceptions that you had about stigma. What was that like for you? Um, when I was first diagnosed, um, I still I still remember it really vividly, and I had this distinct feeling that I, I walked into the doctors, and I was so amazed at how sort of sort of he wasn't very concerned. He's was like, "Yeah, you're HIV positive. It's going to be fine. You'll just take some medication, and everything's going to be okay." So you you perhaps weren't really prepared for anything at all. Like, do you mean that uh, it was just sort of a, okay, like you just sort of. Okay, you're HIV positive rather than you, you didn't really feel supported at well, that time? Well, at the time, I guess in my mind, HIV meant AIDS and death, and that's what I knew about it. There's, so I you think, had a similar attitude to perhaps what other people have. Exactly yeah. right. So I think that um, a lot of, uh, you know, when we talk about stigma, this internalized stigma of what I thought it was going to mean for myself. Um, I think we all remember, you know, health campaigns back in the 80s. But since then, there's been no sort of, um, I mean, recently I've seen a few great videos on YouTube about, they talk, they talk about, um, you know, the new treatments and how it's a lot better for living with HIV. But back then I didn't know any of that. So I just assumed that I was going to get really sick really quickly. So that's such a double edged sword, really, that if we look back to those 80s campaigns, you know, Mm -hmm. the Grim Reaper being the the most famous one is that, um, it was very effective in terms of getting the message out there. But, of course, the reality has changed since then. Exactly right. And uh, people still kind of hang on to that as being the association. A lot of people still hang on to that as being the association. I, I think it's a really tricky one to tackle because, on one hand, you're trying to tell people that if you get HIV, you're going to be okay. Mm. On the other hand, you're trying to tell people to have, say, sex. So it's it's like where, where does the message fall? So it's a really tricky sort of message to sell. Yeah, for sure. Um, when you, you talk about uh, your decision to reveal this today, mm-hmm. what, what was the thinking process that led you up to this point he- here? Um, I think specifically the biggest motivation for me doing this was um, as the HIV positive community, I feel um, that we expect people's attitudes to change towards you know stigma and what it is like to live as being HIV positive, but if we're not willing to put ourselves out there and say, you know, put a hand up and say we are HIV positive, then how is the community in general going to change their attitude towards it? So I think we we have to make the first step. So you feel like um, if you don't do this, you're in some way contributing to the stigma? I think I think back to when, you know, it was sort of frowned upon to be gay and the community stood up and, you know, said we're, you know, we're here, or, you know... Um, sort of the out and proud movement, the and same yeah. s- sort of thinking behind it. So I, I guess in the in the in the same sense, like that's what I want to do, and you know, lead by example, show that you know I'm a you know, pretty average person. I work, um, you know, I'm really healthy, um, and HIV is just one section of my life, so that people can change their perceptions about what it means. Definitely. I mean, that is uh, that is such a significant move and, you know, I can't applaud you enough for this kind of courage to do this because I think that's precisely correct, that um, without people being out there and being uh, able to say, you know, this is me and, and get the conversation started yeah. and, and to have these kinds of conversations like we're having now and like you're having with the world now, um, it does reduce that, uh, that sense of stigma. You mentioned the role that drug use has taken uh, in your life. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I was trying to think where to start. Um, I guess I started experimenting with drugs in high school. It Mm -hmm. it wasn't anything um, out of control or outrageous, but particularly um, in the gay community, methamphetamine was something I started maybe when I was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you mentioned that that was partly as a coping mechanism? It's funny. I guess it certainly was um, at that stage to sort of cope with just being gay. I think we all kind of come to terms with it in different ways. And I guess drugs sort of, you know, let me do things that maybe I wasn't confident enough to do if I wasn't, you know, high or wasted or drunk or whatever mm-hmm. it may be at the time. Um, I guess the the tricky one with methamphetamine is that you, you all your rules kind of go out the window. Um, and I guess you make decisions that maybe you wouldn't do when, when you were um, straight, I guess. So... Um, I've thought about this a lot. I was thinking about this particularly last night. I don't believe um, that I would still be HIV positive had it not been for my drug use earlier on. Right. We are talking with Dean Camilleri, who has just uh, r- revealed to uh, the world, essentially his world of Facebook and then the wider world <laughs> through this broadcast uh, about his uh, HIV positive status. Now, uh, we're also joined by Peter Higgs, who is a senior fellow at uh, the Burnett Institute. Uh, Peter, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a bit croaky this morning. No, you're coming through loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and um, the sort of work that you've been doing in this area. Might be having some uh, problems uh, getting uh, Peter to stay on the line there. Sorry, Peter. Um, Dean, if you could c- continue a little bit about your uh, experience with, in terms of uh, methamphetamine use. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what that was like. Um, yeah. So I think we, we originally started sort of using it at dance parties, but mm-hmm. then it kind of led on. And particularly with my methamphetamine use, it was um, something that I would use when... Um, I was going to hook up with with another guy and it, just to sort of break down the barriers or, you know, get a connection going. So uh, would you say that you were kind of nervous and that that allowed you, you had some anxiety in those sort of situations and it allowed you to relax? Absolutely. I was, I was pretty nervous um, when I was growing up and as a teenager and, and coming out, you know, I never really felt, felt comfortable in my own skin. So using drugs or even just drinking any whatever it was there's no way that i could go out to a club straight or meet somebody or have sex if, if there wasn't for some sort of stub- substance so involved. you got into really a pattern i guess where you uh had to use some sort of substance to to ha- when you were having sex absolutely yeah. um and it's hard because breaking that pattern later on is sort of really tricky because you're like, oh, you know, I'm not drunk or I'm not stoned. How do how am I going to sort of negotiate this? I mean, or that's what's one it of the really like? risky things about uh, using yeah, any kind of substance when you're you're having sex is that people do get into these kind of habits and and as you say, it's very hard to break them. And that's really what you found. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and then it starts sort of overflowing to other areas of your life. Like you might have a, a fight with somebody, but you're, you're so you're relying on these drugs so heavily that as soon as anything gets out of control it's straight back to the drugs to kind of control it all, um, you know, control your emotions or whatever it may be. Or finding a way to control your emotions. Absolutely. Yeah, or controlling the situation. And not in a healthy way either. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So what, what actually, what kind of trajectory did you go on then? Um, in, in my particular story, there were two instances where things got pretty bad, I guess out of control, um, and life became really chaotic. Um, I think the first time when I was about 25 and to kind of fix that, it, um, I decided to move to Queensland, do a bit of a locational switch, you know, change the people and the places. Yeah. So and I, I guess rem- these are kind of patterns of finding a way to <laughs> disconnect. Absolutely. And as I sort of got more educated in that, that area of, um, you know, addiction and what that means, I, I kind of saw similar behavior in other people. Mm. Um, but it's funny because I was in Brisbane, I ended up, around the same kind of people doing the same kind of stuff. So I kind of realized very quickly that the change sort of ha- had to come from me. Um, so I later on when I was 27, um, again, it got out of control and I was dating somebody who it wasn't working very well. And um, I remember specifically one time we'd had this big fight and I was bringing up my drug dealer to score because I couldn't handle what was going on like mm. emotionally. And I remember alarm bells were going off at that point to... Um, Certainly, you know, I knew something was wrong and that we needed to sort of um, control this. It became apparent that you were using it as a, as a coping mechanism. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, you are listening uh, to uh, via Joy 94.9 or perhaps you're uh, watching or listening via World AIDS Day Worldwide.org. We certainly do invite you to enjoy, uh, to join the conversation. Feel free to send us an email on air at joy.org.au 
or use the hashtag JoyWAD. Just like uh, Jez has on Twitter, who uh, has written in and said, uh, Dean is brave, honest and cute. Very, very nice. And uh, hello to Paul, who says, uh, well done to Dean uh, for coming out as HIV positive for the first time. So some support out there uh, for you, Dean. How does that um, make you feel? A little bit better. Um, mm. it's, it's still quite... I'm still quite nervous just to see the responses from, you know, the wider community. And like I said, there's a lot of people and particularly one segment, I guess, are people that I work with. So I'm, I'm kind of keen to see how that plays out as well. I can imagine a little bit more about that. Uh, we are, hopefully we've got uh, Peter Higgs from the Burnett Institute. Uh, are you back, Peter? I think so, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, very good. Thank you very much uh, once again uh, for joining us. Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing uh, in this area. Yep. So... Um, as I kind of mentioned, I've been working with the Burnett for the last 16 years or so, and my first role there was to do some work with um, the Vietnamese injecting drug user community. And people may remember back in Melbourne in the, the mid-90s, the street drug markets of Melbourne were pretty um, overrun with people who were of Vietnamese ethnicity who were very involved in the distribution of street drugs, but we weren't seeing many of those um, people themselves in it to our um, harm reduction services and especially needles and syringe programs. So we were very worried that perhaps there was an opportunity for um, HIV especially to spread amongst that small group. Most people will probably know that HIV isn't a really big problem for injecting drug use in Australia. We don't have many people who are injecting drug users who live with HIV. Um, less than 1% of people who've ever injected, essentially, if that's the only risk factor, um, uh, have been infected with HIV. So we are really worried about that. Mm. And I've kind of gone on, we've got a little bit of money here and there and gone on and done lots of different things since then. And I guess one of the, the interesting things, even though it, I didn't see HIV initially, I have come across it in the Vietnamese community over time. and. Um, we certainly know that some of that is a result of the huge numbers of people who've got HIV in Vietnam as a result of injecting drug use, where up to 60, 70% of some of those injecting communities are already infected. Right. There's uh, quite some uh, significant statistics. Well, what do you see? What is the research uh, saying uh, at the moment uh, in relation to, I guess, the kind of broader link between uh, injecting drug users and HIV? Yeah, well, bro more broadly, I mean, HIV is being driven by injecting drug use in lots of parts of the world. Um, it's just in Australia we're very fortunate that we don't get much of it. But having said that, this week in one of our studies we diagnosed someone with HIV. So it's kind of ironic. His birthday is actually today as well. He'll be 29 today. Um, we've been following him for eight years. Um, and yeah, so it, it does happen. Um, but yeah, certainly in Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, um, some parts of um, the US, their HIV is still very much um, a big issue for people who inject drugs. So what are the major ways in which uh, we need to respond uh, to this? Uh, there's sure. a quite startling statistics, as we say. Yep. Well, I mean, the main way is to fund needle and syringe programs and to ensure that people have that opportunity to, when they are injecting, that they're using it with sterile injecting equipment. And we know that I've just been to a meeting in Brisbane that was um, a woman called Stephanie Strafty who's done a lot of work on the Mexican-US border around that and even trialling interventions for doing work with female sex workers who inject drugs. The primary way of being able to control HIV was to give um, needles and syringes to those people. So even amongst that community where they were trialling a range of interventions, education. We know that actually giving people the tools to stop them becoming infected is what's most essential. And what, what have some, been some of the reasons why that has been a challenge or that hasn't uh, happened as, as um, we would perhaps like? Oh, gosh. <laughs> where do yeah. you start, perhaps? Yeah, partly. I mean, stigma um, is a, a massive issue for people who inject drugs. The fact that some 
community. Some governments think that by providing them with the equipment to do it, that we're encouraging people to inject drugs. Look, isn't that just remarkable that that attitude is still uh, around? I mean, the, the science has been pretty clear about this for a long time, that uh, there needs to be a harm minimisation approach uh, yeah. to uh, injecting drug users. But for some reason, governments and, and I think to the to an extent the community still have this kind of idea it, it, yeah. it sort of is baffling to me it is and i guess i mean it, it kind of stems from the fact that people think that they're doing something illegal we don't want to encourage people doing illegal things and i yeah i mean for someone who has been giving out needles and syringes for 15 20 years um in street drug markets to communities of people. I mean, even initially, I remember going up to some of these young people, they were freaked out themselves, like being given this sort of stuff, you're just going to come up and give them mm. to us, you know? So, yeah, I don't, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's just terrible how, um, yeah, how unsympathetic, I guess, some communities and governments are to the fact that this is the way to, to respond and it, it is the most effective way to respond. Give drug users themselves, they know what to do when they've got sterile equipment. Yeah, that's right. Dean, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. Um, I, I think the services here in Australia are excellent, particularly in Melbourne, because um, I wasn't injecting drug, well, I wasn't injecting drug user for a very long time. Um, you know, we have needle exchanges in St Kilda, uh, there's, you know, one at the Werribee Hospital, there's actually delivery services, you can get like a box of needles quicker than you can get a pizza in mm -hmm. some suburbs, which is, you know, I mean, it's not encouraging people to use drugs, but if they're going to, at least they're going to be using clean needles. Well, the uh, the approach to, to this is, you know, m uh, more than just... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, trying to stop drug use, you know, the, it needs to be multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of reality, the, re the reality out there is that uh, if we can minimise the risk, um, people are going to, people's health is going to be improved uh, as a result. And so that kind of approach is, you know, the, and the science has been clear for a long time. Absolutely. And I think if they just, like countries that even look at it purely from a cost perspective, if they're giving out needles, well, that's one cost, but if they're treating a bunch of people with HIV, that's certainly going to be a much larger cost later on down the track. So it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, indeed. What are the other kinds of barriers to this, Peter? Um, I guess, I mean, part of it is for people themselves to feel comfortable going to services or having services that treat people with a bit of dignity and respect. And as Dean's kind of mentioned, I think we are very fortunate in Melbourne that people can go into a needle and syringe program for the first time and feel like they aren't treated as unhuman or inhuman. Um, so that, that really is an essential component. I mean, I think some of the work that I've been doing really shows that families find this difficult as well, that, you know, you are, as a health worker, you know, allowing people to continue to inject and they find that very confronting for people. So. Um, to, to work with that and I guess in some ways drug users themselves when they're struggling with wanting to reduce or cut down that can be very difficult as well like in some ways some people would argue that they you know if it wasn't so easy perhaps I wouldn't be continuing to do that but I guess for me I've really been very keen about making sure that people don't feel like that you know it is chronically relapsing condition people go in and out of their drug use over time and that they need to be able to get access to sterile equipment when they need it. Indeed. Uh, you are uh, listening uh, to Joy 94.9 or perhaps um, watching on World AIDS Day at worldwide.org. We certainly invite you to join the conversation. You can email on air at joy.org.au or use the Twitter hashtag JoyWAD. We're talking with Dean Camilleri, who has just uh, revealed his status uh, to the world as being a, HI, a HIV positive man. Um, we will say, Dean, that um, that uh, there are numerous, uh, the notifications are coming in, there are numerous messages, numerous messages of support waiting on your Facebook page for when this interview uh, finishes. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that, uh, it, we, I think we need to talk about a little bit more of the reaction as we go along. Um, we do, as we say, uh, we are talking at this point about uh, no one being left behind and at this point uh, people who use drugs. And please, we do invite you to, if you've got any perceptions or ideas or interesting uh, comments about this, please do let us know on air at joy.org.au. Uh, you are listening 
um, to Joy 94.9 and World AIDS Day Worldwide dot org is the website. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. You are listening to Joy 94.9 or perhaps watching at worldaidsdayworldwide.org. My name is Glenn Dalton and this hour we are talking about uh, no one being left behind, particularly on this special day, World AIDS Day, the connection between HIV and people who use drugs. I'm joined live in the studio by Dean Camilleri, who earlier today revealed via Facebook and also, as we say, to the world uh, that he was uh, living with HIV. And uh, also, we are joined by Peter Higgs from the Burnett Institute. Now, Dean, how, how are you sort of going? It's been about uh, 30 minutes since you uh, posted uh, online. How, what's the... Emotion at the uh, like at the moment. Um, my notification center is kind of full, so um, I'll I'll check it when I when I leave the studio. I think, but mm-hmm. it looks like uh, I'm getting a lot of responses. Well, you had obviously had some reactions before because some people knew, but how many? How, what were the what were the kind of, who were the people that did know uh, that you were HIV positive? Um, both my parents knew already. Um, I told them shortly after being diagnosed. Um, how was that? <laughs> It wasn't very good. Um, my mum didn't take it very well. She got quite upset. This is a long time ago, and it, her her idea of what it was going to mean, she you know she thought I was going to die you know in a few years. So she was really upset. But mm. I remember I brought her along to a doctor's appointment, and she's absolutely fine with it. I also told so my t- parents. How long did it take for her to get to the point where she's more accepting of it? I guess now, or she moved through that period of. I don't know, that, that that initial reaction. I think it took her a, a few years just to see that I was doing okay. And particularly in the last few years, I've been doing certainly a lot better. And, um, you know, so it's a re- more recent thing. Absolutely. she's She used to shy away from it. Whenever we talk about it, you know, around the dinner table, she'd kind of shut off and go cold. But now she's more than happy to talk about it. I guess it's a period of adjusting. So mm. she's much better now. Yeah, the patterns of avoidance, I yeah. suppose, have been in some ways intergenerational when you talk about your own avoidance of trying to get over anxiety yeah. and trying to get over being gay with the uh, use of drugs and then perhaps uh, <laughs> your, your mum's avoidance of, of talking about this. What yeah. about your father? He was really great. My dad's sort of very matter of fact. So what's this going to mean? What are we going to do about it? That was, that was it. He was, I'm sure, you know, he must have been a little bit upset, but he was very matter of fact and it was okay. But my both my parents already knew my brother um, and my close circle of friends. So there, there wasn't um, many people that knew out of that like Facebook group of 300 friends there right. would have been maybe 20 or 30 so wow so only a real small community of yeah, people it, did it's, know this it's something that I've kept to myself it's information that I've cu- tried to control really mm. tightly I mean I've done work in the community with the Positive Speakers Bureau but they're very targeted audiences yeah. they're not people that are going to cross paths with you know other sectors of my you know friends so it's um it's going to be a big surprise for a lot of people, I, I imagine. But I did tell my parents. I gave them the heads up just in case they got questions or phone calls. So they uh-huh. knew that I was doing this this morning. Yeah. And what was their reaction to you coming out, essentially? Well, I was really amazed because I thought my mom was going to do the big, you know, be careful, you can't take it back. And she was like, right, we're here to support you. And my dad was like, great, you know, that's wow. whatever you think. So I was really amazed at both their reactions. I think they've come a long way since, I guess we all have come a long way now that we know a lot more about it and we understand. And, and they really understand why I'm doing this as well they know my motivations for wanting to break down this stigma so um, I think I think they're actually a little bit proud of me for doing this as well yeah Peter what's uh, your perception on uh, when you hear Dean's story and when you hear about his um, experiences of of stigma what's your uh, perception on this yeah I mean uh, my understanding of stigma really comes from I guess the sorts of stories that people who inject drugs and are in our studies tell me about the way they are treated and it's um I mean it isn't a universal kind of system it's great that Dean's got a really supportive family but as he suggested you know that does take time and I'm sure there are going to have been you know times early on where it was really difficult and he kind of just struggled in being able to how do you do that in the most effective way but yeah I mean our I guess our biggest thing is for people who have, you know, ongoing dependencies and have to turn up to health services that aren't their usual ones. So going to emergency departments at hospitals when they're particularly um, got some infection, Mm -hmm. um, injecting related, 
they get treated badly because they're injecting drug use. Uh, they get assumed that they're going there to be, you know, um, seeking other opiate drugs. That's a pretty then, frequent experience from um, your well, your it experience. Can, it is. Hmm. Might be having a few more technical uh, issues. Uh, I guess that that stigma. I guess when we hear what Peter says, that stigma is a, a bit of a reality that's uh, unfortunately very common for people. But um, other than uh, your parents, what what other networks had you told uh, about this, Dean? Um, I guess the the people that I work with with Living Positive Victoria mm. would would know um, my partners. But like I said, it's I've, I've always sort of erred on the um, side of caution. Like I won't tell people unless I have to tell mm-hmm. them. In what circumstances do you have to tell them? Um, see, in Victoria, I, the uh, HIV laws are a little bit different than New South mm-hmm. Wales. So if you're having protected sex with someone, you're not um, obligated to tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was dating someone, or um, then obviously it's something you need to come out with. So... Um, those situations can go really great. Sometimes they don't go so well. Yeah, what has that been like? I mean, if I, I think about you know, my experiences as a gay man, you know, I think that that kind of conversation, when that has happened, has been quite awkward. What's your experience been like when you you have revealed to people that you are you know, sexual partners, you're HIV positive? Um, again, it's, it's something that I'm really shy about doing. So I... Not that I play games with it, but I'll try and uh, turn the conversation to someone who who I know is HIV positive and Mm. see how they react. If they react badly, um, um, you know. So what what do you mean? You you uh, will sort of bring up someone and and talk about them that they are HIV positive? Yeah, just to sort of gauge the reaction and if it's a good reaction. I mean, this is sort of things that I've done in the past. I think since today, putting this on Facebook, this is something that I'm going to be a lot more forward with. So today's kind of like go day and trying to change my attitudes towards myself, I guess. And like your mum says, no turning back. <laughs> no turning back. Um, exactly right. So, but I would normally just gauge the reaction about, you know, how they generally perceive HIV with, I'll bring up a friend or someone we know who's mutual, who's, mm-hmm. who's positive. So, and if they act badly, then, you know, I probably may not proceed with telling them. Um, Testing the waters. Yeah. But if they with. react well, well then I'll go ahead and see how it goes. I've had reactions where they've been fantastic and, you know, they don't care. And I've had other reactions where, you know, I've just been on a date and I've never heard from them ever again. So right. it's, it can sort of chip away at your confidence a little bit. Yeah. I can, uh, I can imagine uh, uh, what, what, has when you when you talk about it chipping away at your confidence, whether it be telling someone, whether it be living with it, whether it be going through the gamut, what what has the impact of being diagnosed been on your confidence, on who you are, and all of those factors? HIV stigma can can really change the way that you look at yourself. Um, I remember when I was diagnosed, um, I really thought it was going to affect, you know, my health and my ability to achieve goals and be healthy. Um, but really stigma has kind of been the thing that's affected me by far greater than any of the medication side effects or, or anything like that. Just the, the way that people look at you or the way that people treat you when they find out that you're HIV positive mm. can really damage your self-esteem and your confidence, um, to a great, to a great degree. So, um... Yeah, that's it's it's something that I want to help change. You know, I work uh, with the Speakers Bureau. You know, going out and educating different groups of people. Today's Facebook reveal. You know, hopefully again break down some more barriers and open a dialogue. But I think the positive community really needs to to you know engage with everyone and 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 show that we can be you know that you can live a long, happy, healthy life. And it's you know HIV stigmas are the real thing that we need to work on. When we hear about uh, Peter talking about the stigma of being an injecting drug yep. user, what, what would you say that you've had experience of, of being both? What would you say? Yeah. Which one? Are, are there comparisons? Are they similar? Is one bigger than the other? I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I haven't um, come across too much stigma with, with the injecting drug use. Um, you know, it was something that I did sort of regularly back when I was using using heavy, back when I, my drug use was more heavy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I still sort of functioned relatively well. So I never came across any of those incidents at hospitals where, you know, I had inf- that sort of never happened to me. So, um, but, you know, I, I imagine that the stigmas are, are very similar. Like you get treated away because of, you know, something that's out of your control, whether it be addiction or HIV. So I imagine that I have some idea about how those people must be feeling. But 
Peter, I think we've uh, got you back uh, on the line there. Welcome back. It's uh, nice to hear you you again. Um, When when we we kind of talk about some of these things, uh, Peter, what are the the main messages that you want to get across on on this World AIDS Day? Well, I guess, I mean, essentially for me is just treating drug users as you would treat any other person. And I think, I mean, that whole... I guess the socialization and that drug users are bad people and that they're the um, responsible for, you know, every time your house gets broken into and all of those kind of things is that really adds another layer onto, I guess, what's happening. To see the way police um, control um, those sorts of things, you often see them stop and search people in. The neighbourhoods that I've been working, some of the street drug markets, you'll have the blue gloves on, the pants will be down, the pockets will be out, just trying to, I guess, build a rapport with people who inject drugs that treats them as ordinary people. And um, that's, I guess, what I've really tried to concentrate on in the work that the Burnett's been doing with people who inject drugs, to be able to engage with them. We need to hear their stories, otherwise we don't have the sorts of information that we need that tells us the things that we need to know about the issues that are going on in their lives. Well, the, the reality is of people who uh, inject drugs is that uh, it's it's not something that they just kind of started doing one morning. Uh, you know, there's a there's a complex story that goes behind that. Um, yeah. There are reasons why people end up becoming drug users. Um, yeah. And so that kind of empathic response is is perhaps what's lacking. Would you agree with that, Peter? Yeah, no, I would. And that that story changes over time as well. And it, I mean, I guess, I mean, I've done a lot of work with people in the court system and you get really sick of hearing the way the magistrates, you know, respond to things or the way the police prosecutor and everyone kind of treats people as though this is just another person who's got a heroin dependency and they're here for this reason. But, you know, people's lives change over their injecting careers. As you heard from Dean, you know, things have gone, you know, at a different level where things were going hard for a while, but he was still functional. And there's a whole, I guess, yeah, for me, it's just trying to make sure that people understand that these people do have families and they've got brothers and sisters who struggle with this stuff themselves. Some of them are using as well. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine some families, some parents have got a number of kids in their families who are using it. It is very confronting, I think, for everyone. But to give that um, sense of humanity back to people and to, I guess, as health services, especially to be able to engage with them in that way, it's really essential. Indeed. Dean, what's your, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I totally agree with Peter. Um, I think, you know, everyone deserves a level of respect. But I also believe with drug users who are aware of their addiction that there's a degree of responsibility that lies with that person. And if you know that you've got an addiction... Um, you know, you're you're in control of that. If you have that information, um, there's so many great services in Melbourne that can help you. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing in my story that stands out the most is that when it was the darkest for me and I remember walking into my doctor's office and saying, I need help, um, there were so many different options and the help was absolutely fantastic. And just to go back to what Peter said, when these people know that they've, they've got a drug addiction problem and it's really, really tough to break, it's, you know, by far one of the... It is the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. Mm. Um, but the the supports are absolutely there. And I believe that the responsibility lies with the drug user in order to, to actually go through with that. I'm interested to hear a little bit more about your story, Dean, in terms of that recovery from um, being a uh, injecting drug user to to trying to grapple with it and overcome it. What, what was that like? What did you go through? What did you do? Um, so at the end of... Um, my heavy drug use period um, things were really really bad I remember going to my GP like I just said before and um, asking for help and she'd seen my like my progress and it get worse and worse and worse what was that point where you were like I need to get help about this um, was there was was there a tipping point yeah it was during summer I'd just broken up with um, a guy and I remember going through a huge amount of drugs and not showing up for work for a week and um, like trying to stand up and just collapsing uh, quite a few times. And I remember that was when I was like, okay, things are really bad. And so your functioning was you know, really adverse. Non-existent, yeah. yeah. Um, so then I d- decided with my GP to go to a, um, a 28-day inpatient rehab program. And what was that like? 
I mean, that's a, it's a pretty significant if you when you talk about the how you know impaired your functioning was to then going into a twenty eight day inpatient program. Yeah, it's um, I had all these ideas about what rehab was going to be like. It's going to be a great little holiday, and there's going to be a pool and celebrities. Um, right. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. Um, so it's it's a in, rehab's a really interesting place. They kind of put you know thirty drug addicts together, completely different addictions. You know, heroin alcoholics you know, gamblers, and then you're you're in this, like, very tiny hospital and you've got to try and talk about your problems and it's very confronting. And I'm in there talking about being gay and HIV and I've got, you know, a 60-year-old grandma who's drinking. It's just, it's a really interesting dynamic, but, and it's hard, hard work. You know, you've got to really sort of dive into why you're using drugs and, and yeah. try and figure it out. But at the end of it, it was, you know, the best thing that I ever did and gave me a really good sort of platform. Like it hasn't been smooth sailing every day since, mm. but it's given me a really good platform to kind of figure out, you know, why I use drugs and, and build my life and set goals and move forward. It's a, certainly a, um, a compelling story. We certainly are inviting your um, contribution to this. Please join the conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au or via Twitter using the hashtag joywad. We'd certainly like to hear your comments. Uh, Peter Higgs uh, from the Burnett Institute, when, when you hear about um, Dean's uh, story of re- rehabilitation, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very different story to the one that I'm hearing most of the time. I guess most, very few of the people that I work with um, have been to rehab in the same way. That's a very positive experience as it's been for Dean. Most people I see will be using methadone or buprenorphine um, as their, I guess, their treatment, um, which is a fantastic um, option for most people who've got heroin dependencies to be able to go to a pharmacy where you're seeing a health mm-hmm. worker um, as a, in a pharmacist every day, you're getting your dose and that's able to, I guess, keep you from having to use heroin for the day. Not that it automatically stops people using heroin and I think, I mean, that's been one of the biggest criticisms for the um, opiate treatment program is that people feel like, well, it's not stopping them using drugs so it can't be effective. But certainly my... It's kind of all or nothing attitude <laughs> that it yeah, has to it kind of work is. all of the time or it's not any use at all. Yeah, but to see the, um, the way in which people respond on pharmacotherapy um, really positively to being able to just give them the space that they need to try and get on with their lives again, is, it's really been really, I guess, an important um, component of the way in which we respond to people who inject drugs in Australia, but also... You know, for people who are HIV positive as well, it just, you know, getting them in to see a health worker through a pharmacy, which is, you know, the way that people get dosed in Victoria anyway, is really important. Dean, you say that it hasn't been smooth sailing for you. What have been some of the bumps along the way? Um, I, I'm sure as Peter could probably um, tell you, uh, relapse is very high in, you know, particularly in the injecting drug use community. Um I know that sort of everyone that I went through rehab with, at least over 50% ended back up in there or relapsing or going through. Um, and I've had, you know, my own sort of trip ups every so often. Um, it's a reality, I guess. It, it really is. Um, and I guess just knowing those warning signs about what's going wrong and how to avoid that um, is really important. Having something else to focus focus on, I found that you know, I love my job. I absolutely love what I do. And having, you know, something to look forward to or something that's fulfilling um, really helps me stay focused on what I want to achieve. It's a real motivator for you. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, before having, you know, this, this great job that I love, you know, you kind of wake up and you, you wouldn't, you know, it's like, how am I going to get through today? Like, what am I going to do? Um, and, you know, you know, that little voice in the back of your head that's telling you to go and use drugs, it's just getting louder and louder. Mm. So... You know, that whole shift in, in my attitude and being focused on what I do is, has been probably my biggest motivator to stop using drugs. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about the kind of things that you found most helpful in overcoming using drugs. What, I mean, what I, 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 don't, I don't expect there's one thing that did everything for you. I, I expect it was a number of things. But what are the sort of things that stand out for you? Um, the, the two big ones were probably the, the inpatient rehab because that gave me a really good foundation. Uh, it gave me a really good introduction to the what they call the recovery community. Um, 
And the second one was a great support network. I could have not done this without my, my family, particularly my dad was just absolutely incredible. When, when I went in there, I was all or nothing. I gave complete financial control away to, to my family to manage for me for the first two years. Wow. Um, so I you know, couldn't spend a cent without them knowing about it, which is what I needed. Um, and I also had an opiate addiction as well, so a f- mix of a few different drugs. Um, so that support network is absolutely crucial. And also, you know, friends who I can tell if I'm having a bad day or if I'm thinking about using or whatever it may be. But I certainly couldn't have not done this by myself. There's no question about that. Mm. Peter, what are your perceptions on this? What are the kind of things that you've seen? I don't know if you, if you can comment about the, um, the, the sort of journey forward for people. Yeah, and... I mean, for me, I guess I've heard so many people talk about a range of different things that work for them, whether it's finding a new life partner, finding some employment, um, their parents starting to accept them instead of like to have them back into the house. So, you know, people who really struggle with having a roof over their head. Um, But I guess it's not just necessarily one thing that works for everyone and certainly that one thing isn't going to work every time for people either. So Yeah, I think that's a really important reality, isn't it? Yeah, and it just, I guess it adds that level of complexity that, you know, that's why, you know, we struggle being able to, to deal with this. So as Dean kind of suggested, you know, the, the rehabilitation works while, it, while you're doing it, certainly, but... It's how, what happens once you get out of rehab and as he was kind of suggesting relapse is a really common and important part of that, I guess, struggle that people have with their opiate or their amphetamine use. Indeed. Uh, Dean, you uh, just uh, well, an hour ago effectively uh, revealed to the world your HIV positive status. Where, where's the emotion at now? Um, I'm really keen to sort of see the comments and see how it's gone. I've had a um, few text messages come through as well from um, friends and, and people. So, I'm, you know, I, this is something that I've wanted to do for a really long time. I've thought this through, um, you know, for about two years now. And I, I wrote my position on it very clearly and, and put it up there. So um, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. There's no more hiding. Um, I'm kind of a little bit nervous about how the, you know, how people are going to treat me. and But it's something that that I think is really important to do. Indeed. Well, you've been a courageous storyteller and um, I thank you for joining me in the studio today to talk about this. It's been a compelling story. Thanks, Glenn. Peter, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, our first technical issue of the broadcast, of course, I'm comes sorry, yeah. from someone just um, probably 10 minutes down the road. So <laughs> it keeps it interesting. Thank you very much for joining me. Stick Around uh, is uh, coming up next is uh, Katie Larson talking about stepping up the pace and a cure.